We're about to dive deep into some ship to ship combat in the astral sea, astral plane and beyond and all that stuff. But first I wanted to give a shout out to the person who taught me the most of anyone. If you haven't heard of Mr. Rex, then what are you doing? Cause he's the man when it comes to lore of the game, when it comes to monsters, planes of existence, anything. I learned a bunch from him before I started this whole YouTube thing. And now he's a friend of the channel. And now for the first time he's launching his own Kickstarter. And that's a really big, important moment to me. And I'm happy to share it with him and shout out his new project, Sands of Doom. Lord Amu, an ancient king and mummy lord with over 30,000 of his own soldiers has awakened to reconquer his land. His undead horde now marches through the deserts towards the small kingdom of Al Karat. This is a D&D adventure levels one through 11 of Egyptian themed sands, pharaohs and mummies. Players have to get stronger while weakening this mummy lord and his massive army and help to prepare the city's defenses for this massive onslaught. With interesting relics and magic items and a whole bunch more packed into this thing, I'm really excited about it. I think it's a really cool spin on a campaign. I just ran my own campaign campaign with a little bit of an Egyptian theme to it. And man, I wish that I could have seen this adventure and could have gleaned some stuff from it. Cause like I said, Mr. Rex is awesome at what he does. And I can't wait to see this project of his. The Kickstarter is available right now. You can check the link down in the description. Show him some love from the dungeon crew. All right, now let's get into the astral plane. The Traveler's Guide to the Astral Plane is here. That's right. This is me and my team's solution to the absolute large gaping void. Huh? It's like a space term void. That there is in Spelljammer in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. Ship to ship combat, creating a ship, how to travel around. There's just the resources in the books were not all the way filled out in, in a way that I feel like I could comfortably run as a dungeon master. And any dungeon master that is going to go into the astral plane out through everything. I just did a video on the astral plane uh, two weeks ago, and this is the whole big picture here. I want to be able to help Dungeon Masters feel confident going out into the astral space of things, which can be a really overwhelming. How do all the mechanics work? If they were players want to customize stuff, what cool things and options can you give them to get excited about this theme? Because sometimes in your campaign, it might be a smaller theme and you go from point A to point B and you spell jam your way to get there. OK, cool. And then this is the focus. But sometimes you might want to have that focus be all the stuff in the middle and be like space pirates. And the current rules as written books did not help that. I heard the community's outcry and me and my team jumped right on it and dove in to make this absolutely huge resource of the Traveler's Guide to the Astral Plane. So we're going to be diving into this PDF a little bit. We'll talk a little bit later about how you can get your hands on it if you want. Getting right into it, the first thing is how you see and perceive things while you're on this spell jammer. A spell jammer is the ship. Spell jamming is the act of flying a spell jammer and going from point A to B in a flying ship of some kind with magical means. Spell jammers can look wildly different from one to the next. One can look like an actual flying bug through space and another one could look like a pirate ship or a more futuristic alien ship. Who knows? The possibilities are endless. To paint the picture of what it's like to be in this spell jammer when you are in void space, which is called wild space and the rules is written, but we've changed up the names a little bit. Um, void space is that again, watch the first video I did on this to talk about all the differences of space, but void space or wild space is the type of thing that we look up into the sky and we see space, black sky, stars, uh, planets, all that kind of stuff. That is void space within the astral sphere that is containing all of that, right? So flying through that, it's just like you would see and you've seen anything having to do with space. It's very, very similar to the, the real version of it. You look out and you just see infinite void of black. And if there's a sh another ship, you can see it from really far away very easily. Only place you could hide is behind other ships or other moons, possibly or planets, whatever. But once you get into the astral sea, things change a little bit and it gets a little bit more difficult to see. So you have the material plane wherever you're on, you go out into the wild space, you get to the edge of that, which is where the astral spheres blocking you in there. You cast that spell to get through and you are in to the astral sea. Floating around through there, things look a little different. It's a lot more colorful and there's these silvery wisps, almost like clouds, but in this like energy, like a uh, Aurora Borealis type of energy waves. It blocks things. It makes it a little harder to see off into the distance. And there's also a lot of floating debris, bodies of dead gods, massive things all in the craziness of the astral plane. Broken down spell jammers, other creatures kind of floating around aimlessly. Lots of stuff's floating around here. So your, your vision's going to be a little bit hard to see way off into the distance. So now that we're in the astral ocean, there's a little bit of things we can talk about as far as how to move around it. So first we're going to talk about movement and then we're going to talk about navigation as far as plotting of how to figure out how to go from point A to B. So how movement works, like I really went into a deeper dive in the last video, is in the void space, in the wild space type area that's very similar to just regular space there's no gravity and you have to fly through magical means and you're going to have to and you still have all of this mass to move and fly through just like you'd have to get out of an atmosphere and all these types of things that real life physics has or whatever and you keep going and going but once you enter the astral sea 
everything changes. If you yourself aren't in a ship, you move based on your mind and intellect. However smart you are, the faster you move. You think thoughts forward and you move forward. And spell jammers are no different. Once you enter in the astral sea, the spell jammer is weightless. Everything has to do, nothing has to do physical. It's all mental. That's why in order to fly a spell jammer, once you're in the astral sea, you have to be at a helm. And that helm literally gets into your head and you fly the ship with your mind. The helms of ships can work wildly differently. And I have a whole thing in the PDF talking about helms and all the different custom helms you can get with a lot of different homebrew inspiration there. But I'm going to focus on overall travel and then ship to ship combat. So we got to get there. But in the Astral Sea, you are able to move at way, way faster speeds than you ever could accomplish on the material plane because of this whole thought weightlessness thing. And you just shunt yourself forward very fast. There are two things that help you navigate your way through this astral plane of infiniteness, right? Which can seem very intimidating, especially for dungeon masters. But that's what we're here for. The first thing here is an astral chart. This is literally a map, but this map magically updates itself to keep track of all the things moving around it. So you have these astral charts are connected to astral spheres. So the world of the Forgotten Realms astral sphere that has all of those things wrapped up in it, there is an astral chart connected to it. And whenever you create an astral chart, it links itself to the closest astral sphere. And it is literally a map of that astral sphere. So then you're flying through, you know, when things are moving around and you can kind of navigate and see things coming before they actually do. But once you leave that astral sphere and you get even farther and farther and farther, you are now off the grid, off the map, unless you have an astral map from a different astral sphere, which would make it way easier to go from point A to B because you could get from point A because you have the astral uh, map and then you get halfway and then now you're kind of lost for a little bit. But if you had the other map, you'd be able to easily get there. This is also huge, I think, for Dungeon Masters because once the players have gone from A to B and they get different astral charts to different places, they'll be able to go there much easier, which is always just a really in general tip of travel is if they've ever gone from point A to B and they ever go from B to A or back and forth, just make it go. Don't make it. Don't run it all off again and make it take too long. The second thing here are astro buoys. You know what a buoy is in the water and the little thing that bobs around. There are astro buoys out into the space where these people that have colonized these areas, whether it be uh, humankind or elves and dwarves, wherever you're from or things that live here for other reasons. Maybe things are planting astro buoys to draw people towards a location for evil purposes. Either way, these astral buoys are landmarks of sorts to be able to help navigate through this craziness, because if things are everywhere and everything's floating around, it's really hard to be like, OK, where the heck are we? Oh, there's an astral buoy right here that's staying at this set location. Think of it like an immovable rod that is locked into that one spot based on whoever put it there. And I would imagine just like on GPS apps, if you have your astral chart would pick up these astral buoys and see where they are. And you could actually mark them and add them into your maps and be able to modify them. And if there is one in the cosmos somewhere that's a trap and an evil trap employ that creatures are drawing people to this astral buoy, someone could probably mark that and be like, oh, somebody marked that as bad. Won't go there. Or someone marked it as bad. Maybe we should go there. Either way, that is just a really cool concept in general. So now we've talked about ships moving around, leaving the material plane, flying through this astral plane and being able to navigate to certain destinations. But what if you get stopped along the way? What if your players wanted to build their own ship? These are the types of things that just, the, again, the book did not do. And this is why we created the PDF. Hopefully you see at this point, if any of the things I've said sound interesting, this is just the tip of the iceberg and everything I've said has there, there's charts and graphs and all this different types of stuff to help you truly, truly run this thing off in space. So if you want to get your hands on this, the link is at the top of the description. You can pick it up for yourself. Patrons during the month of December get this as part of the monthly rewards that I give my patrons. Also during the month of uh, December, I have a little bit of extra bonus that I give to patrons. You get a, twice the PDF because normally you get two PDFs every single month, a featured PDF, kind of like this crazy thing we're doing here and a thing called the DC Playbook, which is a steady resource of general things you can use in your sessions right now. But during the month of December, you get four of these PDFs because you get the, the month that came from before as a bonus. Thank you. Or if December's already passed and you're in the future now, the link to my website, which is all my PDFs are at, is down there too. All right, now let's build some ships and then crash some ships, some, sh some ships, some, some ships. Whew. All right, I'm going to show you a chart here from the PDF. We have the ship components here. There's a hull, a control component and a movement component. And sometimes certain spell jammers, if you're cool, will have a weapon components. The hull is a ship's hull its basic frame. One of the other components are mounted. The hull is the largest component of the ship and makes up the majority of the ship's cost. And we'll get into cost and you can build ships and different ships have different sizes you can spend and be able to customize. It's really it's really cool. The control and movement work like this. The control steers the ship and the movement thrusts the ship forward. The analogy for a boat type of situation, the oars would be the movement to shut it forward and the and the rudder beneath the water would be the thing that steers. All of these things in spell jammers are controlled by that helm that the, the person flying the ship is under control of and they're in control of everything. 
Also, if you see the word astral jumper anywhere, that's what we've called spell jammers. Instead of spell jammers, we call them astral jumpers. Same thing. Now, this chart here is really cool because you can have different class sizes of your spell jammers, tiny all the way up to gargantuan spell jammer. That's just so cool to even think about. Ship spaces are literally like coupons to build your ship out. Imagine a D&D grid out there of all those little white squares all over the place. You have 12 squares to build your ship. How do you want to build your ship? You can build it like this, build it like that. I'll put little pictures on this thing to just show uh, what I'm talking about in general, but tiny ships only have 12 ship spaces. The creature capacity column shows how many people at minimum you need to run the ship. It has to have at least one creature on there to run this ship. And at most, it can only hoard a maximum capacity of four creatures of medium size. It can only hold one thing of cargo and it costs that much gold. Now scale things up to gargantuan and you have to have at least 48 people on the ship just to get the thing operating and running, people in all the right places, hoisting all the right stuff, doing all the ship stuff. And you have 720 spaces to work with and man, you could craft and create a multi-leveled, multi-layered ship. And now I got a whole list of those weapons because everybody loves weapons in space and all that kind of stuff, adding on weaponizing your spell jammer, which would be super crazy. And you could just be space pirates. How cool is that? Um, for the weapons, we've come up with four different categories of Renaissance, modern, fantasy, and futuristic. And these are just inspirations to what it kind of weapons these are. Now, all of these would be fully functional in the astral plane and shooting things and projecting things, whether it be a harpoon gun or whatever. Because we got things like a trebuchet from the old school type stuff, a ballista, an arbalest, I think is how you say it. I'll show this one as an example, 1500 gold, and his arbalist is a massive crossbow, a variation of a ballista with a steel prod that allows to generate an additional large amount of force. It requires three actions to be able to shoot off, which also is usually performed by people on your on your ship. One action to load, one to aim, one to fire. Makes a ranged weapon attack of 800 feet, plus eight to hit, can't hit targets within 60 feet. It does 5d10 piercing damage. And that's just one of the weapons. Honestly, it was one of the more simple weapons. We have cannon, harpoon gun, an iron cyclone. This one's nasty. It's a spinning saw blade flying flying through the air to chop and saw through the ship and its crew. Then there's a howitzer, mortar, minigun, photon cannon, void beam. You can get as crazy as you want with these things. So hopefully these different type of weapons inspire you to create your own weapons and start adding on weapons onto your thing to be able to have ship to ship combat. So here we go. This was what y'all might have been wanting right here is the ship to ship combat. There's lots of ways that this could be really lame if you uh, run these things off and set up these rules to be just these weird ships just fighting like normal combat and it almost feels like you're playing with toys that the, that's not what I want it to feel like I want the players to be on these ships doing combat and there's like ships and other ships and what are they doing and they feel like they're actively playing a role in this whether you're at range and it's one ship versus another ship and that feels like a really special type of combat or these ships or people are boarding other ships as there's other ships across the way so many things could happen so when it comes to distances here what we've done is put in four distances there is boarding range boarding range is 60 feet or shorter another ship could start to board another ship that is literally essentially like melee range short range then is from 60 to 600 feet in that little pocket there you're still at a decent range you're short range you're close and the, the weapons are going to all be hitting all types of weapons are going to be hitting at this short range but then we get in a long range it goes from 600 feet out to 1200 feet now those are only long range type of weapons and all of those weapons i just listed off uh, they all have ranges and that's all going to play into some strategy here as far as what what type of weapons you outfit your ship with all that stuff and then there's the beyond range anything farther than 1200 feet and there aren't really weapons that could hit from that far away because that might be broken or maybe you could create one also now these weapons have to have people fire them they're not just simple weapons you hold in one hand and you fire them these are large very big weapons that you mount onto a ship it takes multiple people sometimes to fire these things but there's still some strategy to this one person could fire a ballista it would just take them a very long time to do and it would take them to load and aim and fire it would take three turns basically for them to get anything done and it might not even fire because we created a fire check. Basically, this sees if the weapon fires accurately and correctly or misfires or whatever. If you have a weapon that takes three people to fire it and you only have two people on there, there's a little chance there that it might fail. But if you don't want to take that risk, you want to load everybody up, you put all three on there, it fires every time. Now, you still have to make an attack roll and see if that hits and stuff. But overall, this ship to ship combat, there's a lot of strategy involved. You roll for initiative, you command your crew, and that is where the fun part happens for me is players are going to be able to take ship action. This is a really cool, fun system of how it works is each player, let's say you have five players, each of them gets one ship action to do. But each of these ship actions have certain prerequisites for who can do that. If you are the captain, you're going to have a certain
certain list of things you can do that other people can't because there's only one captain. There's also conditions about helmsman, first mate, the certain ranges where you're at. Each of these actions require certain things and based on what you're doing and what you want to do, you can choose what you want to spend your ship action on. And once you choose your ship action, you can choose a certain amount of crew members to assign to that action. So let's say you have five players and there's 20 people in your crew, not counting the players, of course. Person number one goes, they want to like uh, evasive maneuvers and they want to move the ship in some way and they can assign a certain amount of people to that and do that action. They make their checks, sees what happens. Then you go to the next person in initiative and the whole thing continues as the enemies are doing the same. So I'm going to read you off a little bit of examples here, but the ship action, you can choose different things. There's movement actions, combat actions, and mitigating, avoiding actions. Movement actions is change course, full speed ahead, halt, lay the course, and take us in or out, getting closer to another ship to maybe even board it. Combat actions are battle stations, cease fire, evasive maneuvers, fire at will, gain an advantage, prepare to board. Oh, man. And the mitigation actions are adjust the course, brace for impact, damage control. Where you're taking on damage, you got to try and repair stuff mid-combat, jettison debris, and triage the wounded. This is just such a cool system and a similar system to 5th edition. You have your initiative, you have your action economy, all these things, but you get to truly feel like you're on a ship and fighting things. And what do you have to do rules as written? I'm sorry, but you just don't have much. And Dungeon Masters are just left hanging of what to do. So I hope that sparks some inspiration of what you can do with your ship to ship combat. Get some things going, get some cool weapons and outfit them to your ship. Get some action economy with cool different moves they can choose to do's on their actions. Oh, it's so cool. And as an extra side note, if you do get to the spot where people are boarding your ship and there's other ships out there, I would still give my players their ship action and they can choose what to do with it. So they can get their movement on their turn and they're going this, but their ship action would just be them commanding, right? So they would essentially get a legendary action, you could call it, on their turn really. So I guess it wouldn't be a legendary action, but they would get their own movement, they'd get their action, bonus action, whatever they're doing as a player in combat on the ships fighting people off, but they would also get on their turn their ship action to say, do this, do that, whatever. But there's just so much here that I really hope you guys enjoy and I really would love to see the feedback from what you guys think of this resource. A lot, a lot went into this thing and there's a lot of great minds that have came together to put this together for y'all and there's so many things that I haven't even talked about in here about there's damaging and injuries the different ship how to run your crew being able to manage your crew how it how that whole thing works repairing ships all of that time out I got a giveaway for you guys that is out of this world see spell jammer get it I hide all my giveaways at the end of videos because I really do appreciate when people stick around the whole time I also make announcements about any sort of giveaways on my patreon because I appreciate the support of someone staying to the end of the video and the support of supporting me on patreon help make this whole thing possible so here's the giveaway I'm giving away a full box set of all three of the Spelljammer books and that Dungeon Master screen all in one and you get to pick any two D&D books you want to add into that to further customize in the spirit of this homebrew channel to customize what kind of books that you want to get in fact in the spirit of customization I'm just going to change it to a $100 Amazon gift card that you can choose to buy what you want and on top of that you get a shopping spree on a friend of the channel's 3d miniature printing website he has a, his own website where he 3d prints miniatures super high quality a lot of the miniatures I have have or from him you can go on there pick what you want i'll buy it for you and it'll ship it right to your door and it gets better because i'm actually doing two of these giveaways and then timesing two on every single thing that we're doing one giveaway is going to be for subscribers like i'm saying thank you for sticking around to the end of the video and supporting what i do and the other giveaway is the exact same stuff all of the same things doubled and that's for patrons so down the very very bottom of the description there is the secret giveaway link go there you can click around get all the stuff each thing you do in that giveaway link gives you certain points all the points you accumulate gives you a chance to win the more points, the better. So for the big community one, all you gotta do is go click around those links. And for the patron one, all you gotta do is be a patron during the month of December. I'll make an announcement of who won and get in touch with you to be able to pick and choose all the stuff you want and ship it to your house. If you do live out of the United States, we might have to work on some things. I'll either set up something for you digitally and you can get all those resources digitally or we'll figure out how to make it happen and still get it to you. Happy holidays and again, thank you so much. Okay, so if you like the stuff we do, we're gonna keep doing these things and we're listening to you in the community, listening to your comments and videos and in out there in the ether of, of space i guess you'd say as to what the people want and we want to try and help you out and provide that and if you want to support us in doing that supporting on patreon is the number one way to help what we do here and there's also the website which has a ton of pdfs to hopefully help take your games to the next level and keep thinking and staying creative <laughs> thinking i just messed up my tagline it's thinking outside the box peace